Please turn to Colossians chapter 3. We've got a great lesson tonight, so I want to get right into it. But before I do that, I want to make an assignment. The best way to remember a chapter in any book, the message of the chapter, is to memorize a verse or two in that chapter that really tells the story of that chapter, what that chapter is all about. So I want you to look at chapter 1, and the assignment is for you to memorize verse 17, 18, and 19. Now, if I ask you to quote John 3.16, all of you could do that. I want you to be able to quote verse 17, 18, and 19 of chapter 1. That's the heart of chapter 1. So between now and next Wednesday night, please memorize those three verses. Turn to chapter 2. I want you to memorize verse 6. Verse 6. And in chapter 3, I want you to remember to memorize verses 1 and 2. Now, if you will do that, you'll not only be able to hide some scripture in your heart and keep it with you, memorizing it, but it will remind you of the message of each of those chapters. That's the summary verse or verses in each case. Look at chapter 1 and and let's read those verses. And he that is Christ is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2, verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Keep in mind now in chapter 3, he is using an analogy, taking off dirty clothes, putting on clean clothes, and then putting in something that you must remember. So, it is put off, put on, and put in. And I, help, I ask you to re- remember this to help you remember the message. A man comes in from the field where he's worked all day, and he's dirty, sweaty, and he comes in tired. He takes off the dirty clothes, he takes a nice bath, and he puts on clean clothes. Then he sits down at the table and eats a wonderful meal. 
That's the story of chapter 3. Look at verse 8. That you put off all these. Put off. Okay? Taking off the dirty clothes. In verse 10, that you put on the new man. And put on, therefore, in verse 12, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, these wonderful Christian graces. And he told us in verse 8 and following the things that we should put off because we are Christians. The old dirty clothes. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, and do not lie to one another because you have put off the old man with his deeds, the dirty clothes. These things have no place in our lives as Christians. Then he said, put on the new man in verse 10, which after God is created in Christ Jesus. Okay? And in verse 12, put on these graces, the clean clothes, bowels of mercies, kindness, humility of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance toward one another, Forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you and put on love, the greatest of them all. Now we've taken off the dirty clothes, we've put on the clean clothes, and we're going to sit down at the table and put something in a nice meal. But before we get there and talk about what we're to put in, we've talked about what to put off and what to put on. Now we're going to talk about what to put in before we do that. Please remember, he is not telling us to do these things in order to win favor with God or to become a Christian. He is telling us to do these things because we have already become Christians. This is what a Christian should be like. We do not earn favor with God by putting on these things or taking off the other things. So he began the chapter by the verse we're going to memorize. Since you have been risen with Christ, you are to seek the things which are above. You are to set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. It is because you have become a new person in Christ that you can take off the old clothes and put on the clean clothes. Okay? You got that? If I don't emphasize that, I have missed the point and I have not told you what I should be telling you. Don't try to earn your favor with God by taking off dirty clothes and putting on clean clothes. No. You do these things because you are a Christian. You have been raised in Christ to a new life. And it comes then natural. And it comes from within. It's not dressing up the outside. It's being clean from the inside. And that's what 
Christ does. He makes us clean on the inside. And when we're clean on the inside, dirty clothes don't match. They don't fit. Anger and malice and blasphemy and filthy words and all that that we've talked about doesn't fit anymore. So we take them off and we put on the new things, mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, forgiveness, and love. Have you noticed in Paul's writings how often he comes back to love? And he says in 1 Corinthians 13, And now about the faith, hope, and love, these three, and the greatest of these is what? Love. And he does that over and over in his writings. And he isn't talking about fleshly love. He's talking about the love of God that the Holy Spirit puts in our hearts. Hold your place and turn with me to Romans chapter 5. I want to show you a wonderful verse about that. Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. We experience the love of God in Christ. It changes everything about our lives. And then we are to be walking, living demonstrations of the love of God to others. Turn to Galatians and look at chapter 5. Verse 22. Well, I think I'll read beginning at verse uh, 18. Look at 18. If ye be led of the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, you're not under the law, and the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. Goodness sakes, what a list. Those are the works of the flesh. As I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. But what is the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. So the Holy Spirit sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. And then we can be Examples of God's love to others. Now let's sit down together at the table. We've taken off the old clothes. We've had a bath. We've put on the new clothes. And now we're going to put in a good meal. And that's the lesson for tonight. Verse 15 of chapter 3. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. 
to the which you are called in one body, the peace of God. Some translations have it, the peace of Christ. Same thing. This is the first part of the new meal. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. I want to ask you, do you have a peaceful heart? You should have. You should have. It is God's gift to those who put their trust in him. None of us can say it, that at all times we're at peace about this or about that. This decision, this problem, this need, this family situation, this financial problem. We can't always say we're at peace. But we can let the peace of God decide the issue for us. Whatever it is that's pulling us in two different directions. And we don't know which way to turn. The peace of God is given to us to help us choose between the two. So we hear ourselves saying, I'm at peace about that. Okay? I'm at peace about that. And when you can say that, what a blessing it is. I'm telling you, it's a blessing. I have peace about that. So we have peace about our lives. We have peace about eternity. We have peace about death. We have peace about heaven. It's God's peace in our hearts. But we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to have it. We have it right now. And we can say within our hearts, I'm at peace about that. Now this is for Scott. Scott, Paul uses a word here when he says, let it rule in your hearts. That's the word from which we get our word umpire. We saw you on TV making those decisions, and I was so proud I could tell folks that's my friend. When an umpire settles an issue, it's done. Paul said, let the peace of God be the umpire in your heart. That settles it. Old Scott said out there and said, he's out. That settled it. It's over. That's exactly the word Paul uses here. Paul was very much interested. He loved athletics like you love baseball. And like Parker and I love football. He's for Tennessee. I'm for Alabama. But Paul loved athletics. You want to know how I know that? He used it in his writings. He talked about the races, winning the race, running a good race. That would be the Athenian games that he probably attended in Athens, and they were the precursors of the Athenian races of later years. But he also used boxing. We know that he went to boxing matches. And he talked about smacking the devil real good. And here he talks about the umpire. The peace of God in your heart is the umpire. Settling the decisions that we have to make. Let me give you an illustration. It's about me. 
When I realized that I was going to have to resign as interim pastor here, there is no way for me to tell you what I went through. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to stay here as long as I could possibly stay. I knew that I had to stop. But it was a struggle in my heart. And I'd pray about it, and I'd cry a little while, and then I'd spend a sleepless night in my bed. I'd say, Lord, I don't want to leave those people. I love them. But when I finally reached that point, and I told you that Sunday morning, I had peace in my heart. For I knew that I had done the right thing. That's what it means. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Life is not always peaceful. No. And if we really would stop and think a minute or two, a lot of folks that you and I know have problems that we don't even know about. And you may have that they don't know about. Life is not always peaceful. And as Christians, we're not to expect to be free of the tensions of life. No. If I stood up here and told the congregation, if you'll become a Christian, you won't ever have any more problems. Would I be telling the truth? No. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. We have problems. And those problems bring about tensions, pulling between. We're always making decisions. We're always in a struggle with something. But here is our helper, the peace of God ruling your heart, umpiring the decision. That's exactly what he said. And would you look at that verse, look at the words? He doesn't say, manufacture the peace of God. He said, let it rule your heart. So peace, the peace of God is always knocking at the door of our hearts. And all we have to do is let it in. And in every situation, we can have peace. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to say when you've worked through a problem, I'm at peace about that. I have peace. That's good. And that's what God will give us. Let the peace of God rule, umpire in your hearts. But then notice the next part of that phrase. To the which you are also called in the body. Now, what is the body? We've talked about it all well, these many weeks. What is the body? The body is the church of which Christ is the head. Okay? So, he says this peace needs to be in your hearts, but also in in the body, in the church.
and you can thank God that there is peace and love in your church. Because let me tell you, some churches go through a lot of problems, struggles. So he says, not only let it rule in your hearts, but let it rule in your body, the church. Be at peace inside and be at peace with others in the body of Christ. And then he adds what he adds six different times in the book of Colossians. And be ye thankful. I asked you a moment ago if you have a peaceful heart. I'd like to ask you now, do you have a thankful heart? Be thankful for what God has already done to prove his faithfulness to you. God has never disappointed you one time. Not one. We've disappointed him, but he never has disappointed us. So Paul said, when you think about God's peace in your heart, be thankful for what God has done in your life. So I have to ask us all, do you take time sometime just to thank God? Just to thank him. Not asking anything, just to thank him. I was pastor at Batesville, Mississippi. And I was preaching a revival over at Clarks, Clarksville, Clarksville, Clarksdale. huh? Clarksdale. Yeah, <laughs> over <laughs> west, about 25 miles away from Baseball. And one night in our revival, we had a glorious service. The presence of God was so real. Several people got saved. It was just a wonderful service, like the kind of service you love to have. And when I got in my car to drive home, I stayed at home that week. I started, as I drove out of the parking lot, I started thanking God for that service out loud. And then I thought, I've got a lot of things to thank him for. And from the time I left Clark something, out at Clarksdale or whatever it is, to drive home, I started naming out loud, just God and me in that car, everything I could think of to thank God for. And when I got to Batesville and to the house, I was still going. It's the same way in your life. You think of what God has done for you. And sometime when you're in the car by yourself driving to Texas or wherever you're going. Just start out loud. Thank you, God, for saving my soul. Thank you, God, for my precious wife. Thank you, God, for my son. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And just keep naming things that God has done for you. 
It'll do something for your heart. And I think it will do something for God's heart too. So he said, let the peace of God umpire your hearts and also the body, the church, and always be thankful for what God has done in your life. Now the second dish at this meal is verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, giving you wisdom. Verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I am so proud of you for the way you love Bible study. Take advantage of every opportunity you have to study the scriptures. There is no substitute for Bible study. You can do a lot of other things, but you can't substitute for that. Study the scriptures. Read the scriptures. Memorize the scriptures. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Providing you with all the wisdom you need in life. That's what he says. In all wisdom. I was thinking this morning as I was reading over these notes about the Bible studies we've had since we started having the Wednesday night service again after COVID. We studied the Sermon on the Mount, you remember? I hope you remember. We studied the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. And we studied 1 John. And now we're getting close to the end of Colossians. Study the scriptures. Don't ever stop studying the scriptures. Take advantage of opportunities to learn the word of God. For you can't substitute it, anything for it. You can't. There is no other like it. Trying to determine what God said and applying it to our heart. But I like his wording in that verse. Look at it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Not just making a visit, but living there. Let the word of Christ live in your hearts. And then he said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, there are two meanings to that. Let the word of Christ dwell in you with all of the richness that it is. But also let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all things. Apply the word of God. It is the word of God that the Holy Spirit uses to help us grow in our faith and our commitment. It's the word of God that directs us. What did the psalmist say? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. The word of God gives us guidance. And the word of God gives us wisdom. Right there in the same verse. Providing all wisdom. I want to say this to you tonight about that.
We ought to love the Lord first above everything else. I remember what Dr. Ellis said he told his bride on their wedding night, Dr. Ellis Fuller. He said he told his wife on their wedding night, sweetheart, I will always love you. but God will always be first in my life. No bride could ask for better assurance than that. Okay. We ought to love God above everything else, period. That's it. But then we ought to love his church, his word, and his people. Love God's word. Study God's word. And always be open to another Bible study because of what it will do in your life. Nothing else can do what it does for us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now this is for Parker. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What is that all about? I'm glad you asked. I like you to ask questions like that. He said, worship God together. Where there is teaching and admonishing and where folks sing God's praises. That's worship. That's what we do when we come to church. So he says, let the peace of God reign in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and worship God together. Where there is teaching and admonishing preaching and singing. I can't sing a lick. Parker was talking to me on the way over here about getting somebody to sing soon in one of the services. And I started to say, well, why don't you ask me? And I've got good reasons why he doesn't ask me. I can't sing a lick. But I tell you what I can do. I can make a joyful noise. At least it's to me joyful. I catch myself going around the house singing a lot of hymns. And I guess it's because I heard my mother do that. I heard her sing, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be, a hundred times. Walking around the house singing, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. I told Charlie about that, and he sang it one Sunday for us. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is what I believe. I believe when we experience the grace of God, he puts a song in our hearts. I do believe that. And one of the expressions of our faith is singing praises to God. I love the singing in the church. I love the choir. I love the special music. I love spiritual songs, and I'm sure you do too. But before we go, I want to say this about that. One way you can tell what a church is like is listen to how it sings.
And I've put that to a test time and time again. When I was in the office, I preached in a different church almost every Sunday. I listened at the singing. And I always told the churches that I pastored, we want to be a singing church. If you find a church that praises God through singing, music, you find a church that is blessed and will be a blessing to others. So keep singing. It's the right thing to do in the church. Sing. Mikhail sang for us at Triune when they were here the song that she sang here last year. Uh, His Eyes on the Sparrow. And I was so blessed. I cried like a baby. Just, it was wonderful. And then I asked her to learn a new song. And I called Parker to see if he had some copies, and he gave her some copies of the new song. I'd rather have Jesus. And she told me the other day, I'm working on it, on, uh, Granddaddy, and I'll have it ready in it next summer to sing at Nolensville. <laughs> I'd rather have Jesus. I love that song. So let's summarize now before we go. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and worship God together. I heard one preacher say, and I believe it is true, you can do other things for the Lord after you worship him. But you're not likely to do much for the Lord if you don't worship him. Is that good, Abby? That's good. So there you are. The lesson for tonight, peace, the word of the Lord, and worship, worship. I love going to church. I just love going to church. Somebody said, well, you're supposed to, you're the preacher. Yeah, that's right. But I loved going to church a long time before I started preaching. There's something about being together with God's people in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. There's just something about that. And I'm glad Paul wrote it in to the book of Colossians. I'm going to try to finish Colossians and two more Wednesday nights. I don't really make any promises, but I'm going to try. Then we'll move to the book of 1 Peter. And I'm already studying it, and I get so excited I can't stand it. So we look forward to that. Thank you for being here.